Hi, my name is Ishai, and I work in Granulate. And in the last few years, there is a tool that I've been using quite a lot, which is very powerful, and yet, I think most of people are not awa aware of this tool, even though it's very simple to use it. But before I get to talk about this tool, I would like to present you a problem that we had in our team a few weeks, uh, a few weeks ago. And the problem is this. In our code base, we have this requirement that whenever we access um, a server, we should always have some kind of a timeout. So no, under no circumstances, we, the code is allowed to, to just hang forever in case the server does not respond to our requests. Uh, and unfortunately, if you are familiar with the requests uh, package, requests.get and post, if you don't pass a timeout argument by default, uh, there is just no timeout and potentially the call can block forever. And that's something we cannot allow. So what we need is some kind of a mechanism that will enforce this behavior, that if someone contributes code to our project and calls request.get without passing a timeout argument, we would like to emit some kind of, a, of an error. Um, and there can, there can be many ways to approach this problem. I bet many of you think about maybe regexes, uh, which is a problematic by itself if you ever uh, worked, with, worked with regexes. Um, but first of all, regexes has the, have this, uh, this innate problem where you can't fully express programming languages using regexes, so that's for a start. And secondly, if you ever did this cat and mouse uh, game with regexes, you know that at some point it's very likely that you will stumble upon an, an example or a use case that you didn't think about. Another possibility, maybe, is to use what's called monkey patching. We can re-implement this, uh, this function ourselves, and uh, we will make some uh, wrapper ar around it, and whenever the function is called without passing a timeout argument, we can raise an error. That has its own problems, because we Test coverage of 100%, as many of you uh, probably know, it's not is not guaranteed, and we wouldn't want this error to raise in our production environment. So, before we proceed to write some horrendous code uh, that parses this, uh, this text, as good programmers, we need to stop and ask ourselves, do we know any kind of a project that faces, faces the exact same problem. And since we're in PyCon, I bet that all of you are familiar with Python itself, because as much as we would like to know whether timeout arguments have been passed to request.get or not, Python faces the exact same problem. Python needs to know, to know whether timeout was passed as well. So how does Python deal with this problem? And that's what brings us to the topic of this lecture, which is abstract syntax trees. So abstract syntax trees, or in short, ASTs, is, are a programmatic representation of code using objects. Whenever Python interprets our uh, code, and many other languages, one of the first thing that it does is to transform the code into a representation of abstract syntax trees. So let's see an example. Let's take, for example, this, uh, this a equals 1 plus 2. And an AST for this snippet of code may look like this. So obviously what we see is an assignment, so that would be the, the root object of our AST between a name, a, and an addition of two constants, 1 and 2. Specifically in Python, the, the underlying objects that are being used are these. And as you can see, it's exactly the same as the previous, uh, the previous tree that we saw, but this time with actual Python objects. And before, before we go any farther, maybe some of you ask yourselves, so, okay, it's a tree that represents syntax, but why is it called an abstract syntax tree? What abstract about it? So it's abstract because it does not fully capture the 
syntactic specifics of the code it parses. So in our case, with or without parentheses, with or without white spaces, with or without, maybe most importantly, comments, the tree would, would look exactly the same. So it captures the logic that the code performs, but not the specific syntax of it. So Python, being the awesome language that it is, provides us the exact module that it uses internally in order to transform code into ASTs. And the most basic thing that we need to be able to do with this module is to take code and parse it. So let's start with the same example. We take this, this example, we, we parse it, and next we dump it. And now let's look at this dump of objects. And first of all, we can see that there is this module, uh, module object, which is a technicality. It's just a, a, an object that can be used as a container for multiple lines. We don't really care about it. So let's, first of all, ex extract from the tree the, uh, the assignment itself, and th which is the part that we care about. And now you can see that it's exactly the same as the tree we saw earlier, and it's very easy to interpret the actual tree from this, this representation of, of the objects. And from, an, from now on, since whenever anyone uses this uh, module, uh, this is the representation that is being used. So from now on, I will not show these, uh, the, uh, a tree like the one that is presented here, but rather these, this uh, dump of, of objects. Let's see another example that will take us, take us a, step, uh, a step farther in our original problem. This time, we have a call to a function named func that gets two arguments, a and c. So now let's pause and think for a second. What do we expect to see in the, in the AST? So like I said, it's a call to a function, so there must be some object that represents a call. And it's very likely that we will see um, a name object for each one of the objects that we see in this code, which are func, a, and c. And as, ex as expected, this is what we get. Again, some technicality and expression. You will face many technicalities if you use the AST module. We don't really care about it. The, the part that we do care about is the call node, which consists of these three elements, func, args, and keywords. And as, as expected, the func, the object that is being called, is the name func, and the arguments are the, name, the names A and C. So at this, at this stage, we have a grasp of what to expect from an AST. So the next thing we need to be able to do is to be able to traverse such trees. And for this, the Python AST module provides us a very simple utility called, co called node visitor. This utility is a class that only implements two functions. The first function is visit that is called for each node. In a second, we'll see how. And all this function does is to check whether for this specific node, there is a visit underscore with the name of the node for this node. If there is such function, it calls it. And if there isn't, it will call the other function that it, that it implements, which is generic visit, which call visits for each one of the children of the current, current node. Let's, let's now see an example for it. Let's say that we would like to write a program that gathers all the function calls in our code and just list the names of the functions that, were, that are being called. So to do that, let's first of all get back to the previous example and try to think what are the parts of this AST that we are interested in. And it's easy to see that, first of all, we're going to implement a visit underscore call, because that's the node we are interested in. And this, in, in this call node, the part that we care about is the func attribute. So now let's see how we can touch with, it with our own hands. So first of all, let's extract from the tree the call node and see that it's indeed a call node. And afterwards, we will use this external package, astore, which has this awesome function that can take an AST and and um, decompile it back into code, uh, and we will call it with the func attribute of the call node. And indeed, as expected, 
we get this func string. So now let's do the exact same thing, but this time with a node visitor. So we will create our own class, which derives from node visitor, and we will start with implementing an init function that initializes an empty list in which we will store our calls. Next, the next thing, thing we will do is to write our visit call, which only has a single line, which is which extracts the func argument, the func attribute of the of the call node, transforms it back into into source code, and store it in in the list. And the last thing we will do is very important. We wouldn't want our traversal of the tree to stop at the f at this call node because there is a possibility that there will be another function call inside the AST of the function call, and in order to continue the traversal, we will need to call generic visit on our, on our current node. And that's it. We can, we can um, instantiate uh, the class we implemented. We can call visit on this example of func1 that is being called with another call of func2. And indeed, after we call visit, in the calls list, we have the names we expected to have. And note that this works because this snippet of code of, of func2 that is being called from func1, the resulting AST of this snippet looks exactly the same no matter what code surrounds it. So the AST of, of this snippet would look the same no matter what's going on around it. And that's why this node visitor can work. So now we have all the tools we need, and we, can back and we can get back to the solution to the problem I presented at the beginning of the talk, which was we would like to have a mechanism that can allow us to identify calls to requests.get that we consider invalid, or in other words, calls for requests.get without the timeout argument. So to do that, we will do the exact same process we did earlier. Let's take an example of, an, of code that we might be interested in and see what it consists of. So first of all, obviously, uh, so first of all, uh, as not as in the previous example, this time around, the func uh, attribute of the call is not a name because it's not just call to, let's say, func. This time, it's a call to, to requests.get. So there is an attribute access in it, and therefore the func here is not just a name, it's an attribute. So that's the first thing. And in our implementation, we would want to, first of all, extract this attribute, and then access its ID, the ID of its value, and see that it's the word requests. Afterwards, we will, we will need to access the other attribute of the attribute object and see that it's get, and lastly, for each one of the keywords, we will, we will want to identify, to identify whether any of them has an arg, an arg attribute that is, equal, that is equals to timeout. Lastly, an edge case that we need to consider is that it's possible that someone would call, like in this example, um, request.get with timeout argument with none, and we need to account for this as well. And we'll do that by accessing the value of the keyword, and if it's constant, we'll need to make sure that the value of this constant is not none. So let's put it all together. Like previously, we start with an init function. This time, it's a list of locations. For each, each AST node um, has an attribute for the for the um, for its line number and its column, and that's what we will store this time. Uh, and afterwards, we will visit. We will create our visit call. We will extract the 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 attribute if it's indeed an attribute. And afterwards, we we'll perform all the th the checks that we saw in the previous slide. We'll check that the that it's actually requests dot get. And afterwards, we will implement the function shortly for checking if the timeout argument is, if there is a valid timeout, timeout argument, if there is n and if there is none, we will append to the locations the line number and the column of the node that we hear. 
And again, like previously, we don't forget to call generic visit at the end of the function. And to implement the has valid timeout tag, we check for each one of the keywords whether it is a valid timeout arg. And if it is, and, and for each one of them, we, uh, we check that the arg attribute of the keyword is timeout. And if its value is a constant, we check that the value of the constant is, is none. And that's it. Let's try it out on this example.py uh, file. Uh, in which you can see in line six, there is a an invalid call to request.get. Um, so that's what we expect to see in our output. And we, like before, we instantiate the class. We call it, uh, we call it with the parsing of the, of the file. Um, and indeed, in the locations, uh, in the locations list, uh, we see what we expected to see, which is line number nine and apparently column number 19. And that's it. That's, the, that's our solution to our very simple problem. But the process that we did here, with, which was to, to investigate specific ASTs and trying to understand what are the parts of these ASTs that we care about, this process can be applied to much, much more complex problems that any one of us might face. And in my opinion, this tool of ASTs should not be seen as exotic or niche, but rather as just another tool in our toolbox that we, that we can use uh, in different circumstances. Um, and obviously, there, there are many more things uh, to, to know and to learn about the subject. During the questions, I will leave uh, this one open, open with some, uh, some more directions to, uh, to things to read about. And that's it. Thank you very much.